now we have Marisol Alcantara here with me, coming. <laughs> Welcome to Action with Angie. Thank you so much, Angie. How are you? Good. And I'm very honored to have you, number one. Thank you. Thank the you. first Afro-Latina senator of the District 30, 31st. Thank um, you. Marisol Alcantara, Dominican. The um, issue that has also I would say awaken the community of New York as a whole, mm -hmm. specifically in Bronx County, what happened with um, Lesandro Guzman Felix Jr. and the death of this 15-year-old kid uh, on the hands of five gang members of Los Trinitarios. That's the name of the gang. Now, 72 hours after that happened, there was a post on Facebook from one of the members saying, uh, we killed the wrong kid. Here's when everything starts, I will say. Even though the killing happened on Wednesday the 22nd, many of us didn't know about this issue until maybe like Friday or Saturday. Now, the whole thing also has to do with the social media usage, the bad usage of social media, I will say, sorry. Um, when you have people recording the issue and not taking action towards it, as a senator, Marisol Alcantara, of District 31, and of course, having access to the community, Dominican community in the Bronx, how do you feel as a mother number one and having this position, political position? Um, I was very sad um, from both sides, from seeing a 15-year-old fighting for his life while adults were standing around not doing anything and seeing people that decided to record this to not even give him dignity while he's dying and instead of rushing him to the hospital to just record it. Um, I also feel sad for the eight young men that have been apprehended. Um, some of them newly arrival in this country, don't even speak English. Um, that we as a society fail them. Um, right now, if you are poor and an immigrant, you don't have access to news outlets. Um, NBC, ABC, the New York Times, they are not running to the South Bronx to do stories about us. Um, some of our kids, they don't even know what the New York Times is. So in a way, social media is the only way that working class communities, communities that are poor, um, immigrant communities can get their message out to one another. Um, I remember when Trayvon Martin was killed. Yes. Um, I used to work for the Reverend Al Sharpton, and we were getting phone calls from Florida and the Carolinas before it made it big in the news here. Because, unfortunately, um, New York is alleged to be a very progressive town, yeah. but the majority of people that live in Manhattan have never been to the Bronx. They don't know what our communities look like. Um, you know, to me, we are fighting for immigrants on the border, which we all need to do. But we also need to fight for those immigrant kids that are here, that are under the shadows, that are, uh, you know, that don't have access to service. Uh, you know, like the New York Times doesn't do stories about us unless something bad has happened. The New York Times doesn't go into these communities and the stories about the lack of services that there are in those communities. So we have no other course but to use social media to communicate with each other and to keep each other in the loop. Now, uh, what, should, what should be done in the community to avoid this type of issues to keep on happening, harming the actual society? Um, what should be done in Congress? Well, um, my district, um, if the incident happened in the Bronx, which is out of my district, um, they need to get mental, uh, mental health services out for the people in the community um, because there's a lot of people that are in pain. Um, and um, I believe there's a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder from the people that saw Junior dying to the people that have seen the video. I saw the video and I feel like I'm traumatized. Yes. Uh, we as a city should have um, advanced services and there are people on the ground giving people information and saying, hey, if you are feeling some sort of way, come and talk to us. We need to reach out to the Trinitarios. I hear people saying, oh, we need to lock them up. That's irresponsible. We don't solve an issue by locking people up. The United States 
is the only industrialized country in the entire world that has more people behind bars. What people need is opportunity. What people need is access to social services. What people need is to attend better schools. Locking people up is not the answer. I know that some people are gonna see this and say, oh yeah, that's easy because it's not your kid. I know that it's not my kid. But I also know that mass incarceration is not the answer. We have seen our jails are filled with black and Latinos, and we are still committing crime. So what we need is to uh, create affordable housing, improve our schools, um, have job training programs for our young people, um, to just say and make a responsible statement that we should lock everybody up it is not what we need. And I think also this has to do a lot with the discipline. Like if you don't have, um, as you say, services that can allow them to have or use their time properly too, after school programs, for example, this is not something that comes just in one day. You're building up a community of also violent people if you don't have them with the opportunity at least of have education for example when you feel that you have nothing and that nobody cares about you those kids live in the richest city in the country yeah. and yet they don't have a basketball court yet they don't have access to a computer in a community center they don't even speak english so why are they in why were some of them in school and didn't learn english that's a good question. You know, I mean, and last but not least, um, I believe that part of being in a society is accepting as an adult your responsibility on how we as a society have failed black and brown men that feel that the only recourse they have for starvation is to join a gang. A lot of those kids. People don't know because, like I say, all these mainstream new outlets, they don't come into our community. Um, I'm sure you probably know many families where you have 10 and 12 people living in a two-bedroom apartment, somebody sleeping in the living room. So it's always fascinating me when people say, oh, I go, I went to the Bronx, I went to Harlem, I went to Washington Heights, and I see people playing outside with the kids, barbecuing and playing dominoes. Yes, because you know what? They cannot play dominoes in their house because the living room is probably somebody's bedroom. We don't have summer homes to go to like other folks in the city do, that they can go to the Poconos or they can go upstate or they can go to the Hamptons. Our Hampton is outside of a building. And one thing that we were talking about before in Spanish was about the uh, labor unions and you being an advocate for the labor rights. Um, I can say, because I studied some of the labor unions um, and some of the labor rights that we, we don't have that much here in the United States as a whole. But one of the things that I have seen also is any employer can fire you for any or no reason. That's one of the things that I have seen myself and I have experienced too. One other thing is also has to do with discrimination within the labor, within your uh, actual place of work. Now. You as a center, and you have been doing this for more than two years. It's not just because you became the center that you have been advocating for the labor unions. I have, I have seen this. I have researched this. And how many years have you been doing this as I, a whole? I have spent about, ever since I graduated, for over 20 years working in the labor movement, organizing workers, representing workers. Um, you know, it's very straight. It's very weird for people that come from other countries when you take a job and then if you don't have a union out of nowhere, your employer says, hi, nice seeing you, goodbye, I don't need you anymore. I have people that come from the Dominican Republic and say, but where's my liquidation? Don't yes. they have to give me yes. my sick days? Don't they have to pay me mm -hmm. my vacation? Don't they give me a liquidation? Because even the Dominican Republic, which is a developing country, have stronger labor laws than the United States. Thank God, New York, we have the highest union density in the country. Um, one of my bills was, in, was put into law by Governor Cuomo, uh, making sure that whatever happens with Janice doesn't affect uh, public sector workers uh, the same way that it probably gonna affect them in another state. Um, we all know that the only way we can have a middle class is if folks are in the labor union. And when you don't have any labor protection, you are at the will of your employee. 
That means that if your boss wakes up on the wrong side of bed, he or she can just come and tell you that they don't need you with a, in a minute's notice. And she's saying Janice, before she starts saying this in Spanish, Janice case is a uh, bill that um, was implemented recently for those who are not in union, don't become, uh, are not, don't belong to a union, I'm sorry, and they still have the rights of a union member. That's something that uh, just passed as a bill, and many corporates, of course, are at fear and may have, may close the unions as well. And that's one of the fears from Marisol Alcantara too. And can you tell me just one more thing about this um, advocacy that you have? Recently, there was, you were protesting on behalf of the nurses of the Association of Nursing in New York, correct? Correct. How was that experience for well, you? Well, we were here because right in my district, um, we have a hospital that um, notified all of the elected officials in the area that they were going to close the inpatient psychiatric care, 30 beds. Um, for us, that was a wake-up call because, um, you know, we have a large Latino population in my district, and there's data that proves that Latina girls between the ages of 12 and 19 have some of the highest rate of suicide in the city. Um, our community is under a lot of stress right now because of immigration, um, because uh, they don't know whether they're gonna be able to petition their parents or not because of gentrification, and people need mental services. The majority of people that are incarcerated are people that needed mental services and never got them. And um, we have seen a trend where a lot of hospitals are closing down their psychiatric care uh, because it's not a money-making unit. Um, what happened in the Bronx would have probably not have happened if those kids have had, had had access to the proper mental health services in their community. And one last thing to close our show today, our program. I have to speak about immigration with you. Um, one of the major things, issues that has been going on has to do with the deport deportation of family members and leaving kids behind. Um, there has been numbers of mothers that have been, and fathers of course, that have been dep deported for the past 15 days. Uh, about 20 to 30,000 people were deported within the time frame of 10 days according to reports. And then a lot of images have been shared about where are these kids and how are they being treated. You in your position as a female, having to deal with a lot of, um, not only the fact that you are an immigrant, but the fact that this is something that has, is a lot, it's very tricky to try to even think about it. How are you actually looking into maybe a immigration reform with this presidency that well, we have? Um, those folks that are coming over, they are our people. They are Latin American. They're coming from Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. Those are our babies that are being ripped away. Those are our kids. You know, they're from our, they're part of our family. And what I could not believe is that when the Department of Immigration said that some of those kids might not ever be returned to their mother. It reminds me about in the history of this country during slavery yes. and during the Holocaust that kids were taken away from Jewish people and sent away to families. It's the most horrible thing that has happened. And I don't think a lot of people in this country realize that the reason why a lot of those kids are coming, why families are coming over is because the United States, the, the debilitated the economy in some of those countries. In those countries, yes. People forget that in 2009, Honduras elected a democratic president, democratically elected, Ceballos. Mm -hmm. the, with the help of the United States, a coup d'etat happened. There's a lot of history in it. Exactly. And the United States has an army base in Honduras. The United States provided army and um, resources and arms to the rebels in Guatemala and in El Salvador. The, um, Trump, yes. Trump talks all the time about MS-13. 
MS-13 wasn't born in Salvador. It wasn't born in Central America. MS-13 was born in the United States. And we exported MS-13 to Central America. The same thing with Los Trinitarios. Exactly. Los Trinitarios are not from the Dominican Republic. They're from New York. How do you see the future when it comes to immigration here? Um, very scary. Um, because I know a lot of Latinos and other immigrants that voted for Trump um, because they didn't think that it was going to be so bad. Um, I remember members of the police department that told me, oh my God, I voted for him because I didn't think he was going to be so bad. Or I, don't, I didn't think he was going to win. Yeah, I know. Or they say they didn't think if he won that he was going to be so bad. He thought that because he was a businessman, he was going to be just a businessman that he was not going to deal with immigration, that he was not going to bother, bother a woman's right to choose, that he was just going to be a businessman and go, was going to make America quote unquote great. Well, his vision of making America great is by kicking out immigrants, taking away a woman's right to choose, and uh, taking away any person of color from this country. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. It's been an honor to have Marisol Alcantara, Senator of District 31 of New York, and having a conversation with her about all these topics, important topics, do you have a message for the people that are watching me? And we will be watching you uh, through our video later on. Asking our community to stay strong, to speak up. Um, we need to have our voices heard. I know that it's very difficult when you look and turn into every, any TV channel and you hear when they talk about Latinos, it's always about us being undocumented as them taking our babies away from us at the border, um, that we need to fight. So our voices are also part of the conversation. So we as a community can have a room at the table and that more young women such as yourself can get a foot into journalism so you can tell our story from our perspective. Muchas gracias. Gracias a mí. Thank you.